Welcome aboard the Snaefell Mountain Railway for our journey from Laxey to the summit. The station master waves us off on our way, and in the next five miles we'll climb nearly 2,000 feet on one of the most fascinating Victorian transport systems in the world. On the left is a sign for the Laxey wheel, and we'll glimpse it in the next couple of minutes. But first we have to safely navigate our way out of Laxey. On the right is the Mines Tavern, where enthusiasts can pass a little time watching the trams coming and going. And beyond it is the shed which stores the diesel rail cars used to service the air traffic control mast at the top of Snaefell. Traffic on the main A2 road from Douglas to Ramsey comes to a halt. We have right of way. And we cross in parallel with the lines of the Manx Electric Railway to our right, a system which predates this one by just a few years. We immediately branch off to the left and our one track becomes two in preparation for the climb. And as the ascent begins, notice the centre rail between the tracks. This is the Fell Inclined Rail System, and we'll hear more about it shortly. On the right, we pass close to the houses on Ham and Egg Terrace. It was here that budding Victorian entrepreneurs set up business to feed the tens of thousands who visited the Laxey Wheel each year. And what began as a good-humoured nickname for the road eventually stuck. On the left is the siding to the Mountain Railway's tram sheds. This spot was where the original terminus was sited, but it was moved to its present location alongside the Manx Electric Railway in 1898 to save the Victorian tourists a walk. We can now glimpse the Laxey Wheel, known as the Lady Isabella, through the trees to our right. Its 72 feet 6 inch red wheel is end on to us at the moment. Named after the wife of the island's governor at the time it was commissioned, Charles Hope, the wheel has become one of the iconic tourist attractions of the Isle of Man. The wheel was designed by Manx engineer Robert Casement, and the huge axle it sits on came from the Mersey Ironworks. Work began on excavating a mine here towards the end of the 18th century and expanded quickly. In 1820, a shaft was sunk to connect the first two operational levels, but it became apparent that water ingress from the river was going to be a problem when five miners were drowned in a flood in 1836. There were further problems a decade later, and four men spent a year digging a 120-yard-long tunnel to divert the river. But as the mine went deeper, eventually going far below sea level, it was decided to commission a water-powered wheel to pump out the working areas. And in 1854, the Lady Isabella was constructed. More than 500 men were employed to bring ore to the surface at the peak of operations, and the mine provided a fifth of Britain's zinc, along with huge quantities of lead and copper. The wheel can bring 250 gallons of water a minute from 1,500 feet underground, and there's a 450-yard-long rod which connects the motion of the wheel to the pump. Mining here came to an end in 1929, but one canny local wasn't about to miss out on what he saw as a golden opportunity. Edwin Neal stepped in to buy the Lady Isabella and run it as a tourist attraction. In the mid-1960s, it passed into the hands of the Manx government and a restoration program followed which ensured that this engineering leviathan from the 19th century continues to operate to this day. There's a spiral staircase to the top of the wheel offering spectacular views of the valley and tourists can watch water from the river power the Lady Isabella at the stately speed of three revolutions a minute. The Isle of Man is renowned for its enthusiasm for maintaining and restoring its heritage transport systems. The major ones are the Isle of Man Steam Railway, the Manx Electric Railway and this one, the Snaefell Mountain Railway. But others are operated by groups of enthusiasts or are privately owned. And the most recent to come back into service completes a trio of tracks to be found passing through Laxey. 
The Great Laxey Mines Railway ran along a one and a half mile 19 inch gauge track from deep inside the mine to an area close to the Mountain Railway's Laxey Terminus, where the ore was washed. It was a huge operation, with more than 170 wagons of ore being moved each day. Part of the line was reopened in 2004 after extensive work, and two replica steam engines named Ant and B take tourists to the Lady Isabella through what is the Isle of Man's only railway tunnel. It's well worth a ride and saves a stiff climb up the hill from Laxey Station. We've been making our own good progress up the hill since we crossed the main road in Laxey. The station is about 130 feet above sea level, and we're now approaching the 500-foot mark. The valley to our right has opened out now, and the greenery of the fields shows that they're highly suitable for rearing the famous Manx sheep. Some of the dividing walls between fields are as much as eight feet thick, though it's likely they're that size simply because they were a handy place to put the rocks and stone removed from the hillside during the operation to clear it. Ahead we can see how the landscape changes as we rise up the Laxey Valley and the fields become fewer in number. We'll get the first sight of our destination about eight minutes into our journey in a couple of minutes' time, but there's still 1,500 feet to climb before we reach the summit. The driver reduces power as we approach a farmer's crossing, linking his fields on the left with a containment area on the right. It's one of very few crossings on this line and is a low hazard compared with the road crossings in Laxey and on the mountain road ahead. The mountain railway takes us in comfort to places we'd otherwise find it difficult or impossible to reach, and it was doubtless this attraction which made the journey so popular with Victorian tourists. The railway was a relatively new method of transport then, and it's difficult to imagine today the effect it had on the ordinary person. Railways had opened up vast areas of Britain and reduced travel time from days to hours. It had been responsible for the dramatic growth and popularity of the seaside holiday and for a similar flood of tourists coming here to the Isle of Man. The Manx Electric Railway had opened up the island's east coast when it arrived in Laxey in 1894 and kick-started the development of this line to take holidaymakers to the summit of the island's highest, indeed only mountain, in comfort. And tens of thousands took advantage of the opportunity to enjoy the most spectacular of views across the Irish Sea in all directions. We've been climbing hard for the last minute or two, but we've now reached the doorway to the upper section of the valley, and for a short time the motors get a little respite from their work. There's a shelf cut into the rock face to carry us through this next length of track, as the valley narrows and its sides steepen. And then it's back to full power. But despite that, you'll hear us slow down as the tram struggles with this next steep incline. Our destination is now in sight, dead ahead. You can see the radio masts on the top. But we're only a third of the way through the climb and just about to pass the 700-foot mark. Time perhaps to talk about the Fell Inclined Rail System. We heard about this briefly earlier. The Fell Rail is the rail which runs down the centre of the track. It started as we began the climb after crossing the road in Laxey and veering off from the line of the Manx Electric Railway. It's named after the British engineer John Fell. His son George had been involved in the first survey of the route up Snay Fell when the idea of a railway to the summit was suggested in 1888. But although the Manx Parliament approved the plan, it came to nothing and it was to be a further seven years before another company resurrected it. George Fell's original route was chosen by them, as was his father's system for ensuring safety through the use of the additional centre braking rail. 
On some mountain railways, the fell rail was also used for traction on the steep inclines, with horizontal drive wheels powered by a separate motor gripping the rail's sides. But on Snaefell, the incline is 1 in 12, and although this is steep by conventional railway standards, it's not enough to be beyond the capabilities of adhesion traction alone. So the fell rail here is used for braking, with a pair of calipers acting on either side of the raised centre track. The system was used successfully until the 1970s, when a report was commissioned to look at ways of updating the mechanical operation of the vehicles. It was suggested that a rheostat braking system should be installed as an addition, and the process was begun in 1977. The Snaefell system works by connecting a resistor across the electric motors, which are turned by the tram as it's pulled downhill by gravity. This creates a mechanical resistance in the motors, and by varying the amount of electrical resistance introduced, the speed of the tram can be controlled on the descent, for the most part without the use of mechanical brakes. The initial system ran up against the problem that it wasn't designed for continuous operation, and within 10 minutes or so the resistors would reach their maximum operating temperature. The solution was to install larger resistors, they're mounted on the roofs of the cars, and the rheostat brakes can now be used for the entire descent as needed. The power controller to the left and slightly behind the driver is used to select the amount of braking applied. Moving it clockwise sends power to the wheels when going uphill, and moving it anti-clockwise connects the resistor to the motors in varying amounts to apply braking on the way back down. The two radio masts on top of Snaefell are clearer now. Partway down the mountainside, just above the small ravine directly ahead of us, you can see the mountain road from Douglas to Ramsey. We will be crossing that shortly. And to the right, close to the small clump of trees, is evidence of more mining activity. This is the Snaefell mine, carved into the rock where the valley meets the base of the mountain. We'll hear more about it in just a moment. But first, there's that moment which happens at least once on each journey as we pass the opposite tram. From around the bend, car number six comes into sight and gets a cheer away from our driver. Built in 1895 by G.F. Milnes, its 461 horsepower electric motors are doing the opposite of ours. Whilst our four are pushing us up the steep incline, the motors in car 6 are working with the resistor on its roof to provide the rheostat braking effect to manage its speed on the way down to Laxey. The Snaefell mine on our right was the highest major mine on the island and its workings ran all the way down to sea level. Looking at this tranquil scene today, it's difficult to imagine how busy the area must have been 150 years ago as a seam of ore from 6 inches to 40 feet wide was worked. But the Snaefell mine is best remembered for being the site of the Isle of Man's worst mining disaster. On the 10th of May 1897, 20 miners were killed deep underground when a candle used to light the work face set fire to timbers. The flames consumed all of the available oxygen before it extinguished itself, and those working at the 171 fathom level were suffocated. Despite strenuous efforts by rescue parties over several days, there was little to do but recover the bodies. It's a remarkable fact that this railway line, which climbs more than 1,800 feet in the space of five miles, was built in just seven months. We heard earlier how George Fell, son of John Fell, who invented the centre rail braking system, had been involved in the first scheme to build this line to the summit of Snay Fell. He surveyed the line in 1888, choosing the most suitable route from Laxey to the peak but nothing came of the idea at that time. It was to be a further seven years before another consortium decided to go ahead. And the speed with which they progressed was impressive. The Snaefell Mountain Railway Association made the decision to begin work at the start of 1895, and the line opened on the 20th of August that year. 
Its early years were no less dramatic than its construction. By December 1895, it had been sold to the Isle of Man Transport and Electric Power Company, which ran the Max Electric Railway along the island's east coast from Douglas to Ramsey. But this company went into liquidation in 1900 following a banking collapse, and the liquidator sold both lines on to the Manx Electric Railway Company, which took over operation of the line in 1902. The mountain road is getting closer and we'll be crossing it in less than three minutes. As with the only other road crossing on our trip back at Laxey, the one ahead is uncontrolled, there are no lights to warn traffic to stop. And with the cars moving at much higher speeds, there's an even greater need for care and caution. The road comes immediately before the bungalow station, the intermediate stopping point which signifies that we'll be two-thirds of the way through our journey. The name of the bungalow is famous throughout the world as a timing point on the Isle of Man TT races. The motorcycle event is held in June each year, and the road over the mountain forms a part of the 37 and three quarter mile circuit of the island. It's a spectacular event which attracts spectators from around the world, and the fastest bikes average well over 120 miles an hour on these narrow country roads. On the right now are a couple of interesting items. The first is an old rusty boiler, followed by an isolated building. Well, both are connected with providing electricity to the mountain railway, playing their role in ensuring there's been an adequate supply of power to the overhead cables so the trams can operate properly. The station ahead of the bungalow was once an important interchange, which allowed Victorian tourists to explore more of the island. In 1907, the company which ran this line introduced a motor charaban service down the valley to Thalty Will, where a hotel and tea room operated. It was, at least in part, designed to take some of the pressure off the hotel at the summit of Snay Fell, which simply couldn't cope with the demand from passengers. At one point, the idea of building a spur from the mountain railway down the valley was suggested, but nothing ever came of it. And as numbers travelling up the mountain dwindled over the decades, the service to Thalty Will became less used, and it was eventually discontinued in 1953. The mountain road is now approaching, and the driver checks the traffic. Then he reduces power to slow us down. He needs to be sure the cars are going to give way before he starts to cross the road. There is a crossover on the track just ahead of the roadway, and both gates have been opened to allow trams to pass through. A group of vehicles clears the crossing ahead, and the following car slows to a stop. With the warning bell sounding, the driver acknowledges the car's giving way, and we're safely onto the road, with the bungalow station on the far side. We'll stop here for a moment to allow passengers on and off, and then we'll be underway again for the final third of our journey to the summit of Snaefell. With a ring of the bell, we're off again, leaving the bungalow station for the summit. When we began our journey in Laxey, we were 130 feet above sea level. Since then, we've climbed our way up the valley to the 1,350-foot mark at the bungalow, and there's a little over 600 feet to go to our destination. Between here and there, we'll make our way around three-quarters of the circumference of the mountain and end up pointing in the direction which is currently to our left. The bungalow marks a change in scenery. From Laxey, we've been looking inside a valley. Now we're on the slopes of the mountain, we can look outwards to enjoy the spectacular and dramatic views of the island, the Irish Sea and beyond. The Manx say that you can see six kingdoms from the summit of Snaefell. The Isle of Man, Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales 
and the Kingdom of God, and on a day like this, the view extends seemingly to infinity. We're currently heading northwest. The hills to our left run down the west coast of the Isle of Man, with the sea and Ireland beyond. Directly ahead, when we reach the next bend, you'll see the smudge on the horizon, which is the southern tip of the Rins of Galloway, Scotland's most southerly point, 20 miles to the south of Stranra. The Isle of Man cherishes its position at the centre of the British Isles. The closest point to what the Manx call the adjacent island is the southern tip of Wigtown Bay in Scotland, just 18 miles from the island's northern tip at the Point of Ayr. England is 30 miles to the east, the closest landfall at St Beeshead in Cumbria, and Wales a little over 40 miles to the south of the island's south coast. In the valley down to our left, we can now catch a glimpse of an area of water. This is the Salby Reservoir. In the mid-1970s, the island suffered a particularly dry year, and it became apparent that the available water supplies, which largely dated back to the era when this mountain railway was built, would not meet the future demands of the island's growing population. But it was a time of rapid fuel price rises, and the idea was put forward that the dam could be adapted to supply a hydroelectric scheme and help offset the cost of electricity production. The height of the proposed dam was more than doubled to provide excess water for the hydro scheme, and the complex opened for business in 1982. Our average speed on this climb is in the region of 10 miles an hour. The trams were originally fitted with four 25 horsepower electric motors when they were built in 1895. But between 1977 and 1979, they were extensively re-engineered and fitted with new bogies custom made by London Transport. The original motors were replaced by 61 horsepower units from trams bought from the German city of Aachen, and the new Rheostat braking system was fitted at the same time. As a result of all this work, it was found that the Snaefell trams could be operated at much higher speeds. But it was felt that this would detract from the service on a tourist line, which was more about the views and the experience than about getting to the destination quickly. So the trams were left to run at about 10 miles an hour, with a subsequent reduction in wear on the vehicles and on the track. We've now turned north as we make our way around the mountain, and the driver has increased power as we encounter the steepest section of the line. Our destination lies on the opposite slope of the mountainside off to our right, and another 200 feet above us. Between here and there, we'll reverse direction to finish off by heading southwest. The slope we're traversing has increased markedly now as we get closer to the summit, and the shelf the Victorian builders created for the track to run on is narrower. High above us to the right, the mountain's two radio masts are clearly in view. One hosts communication systems used by air traffic control to keep in touch with aircraft operating over the Irish Sea and beyond, whilst the other is used for local radio and communication services. We're making swift progress at the moment, approaching the final stages of our journey. Over the course of the next four minutes, we'll be turning continuously, and the vista will open up as the whole of the northeast section of the Irish Sea rotates in front of us. The beginnings of the island's northern plain come into sight over the hump of the hills on the left. It lies to the north of the North Barul chain of hills, one of a number of peaks which divide the island in two. The difference in the geology is an indication that the Isle of Man was formed from parts of two different tectonic plates, one of which originated in the South Seas. The northern port of Ramsey is on the southeastern side of the plain. We'll see that shortly. 
and a wide stretch of beach runs all the way from the town around the northern tip of the island and down the west coast to just short of Peel behind us. The Point of Air, the Isle of Man's most northerly point, comes into view, and the water of the Irish Sea changes colour to a bright blue to the southeast of it. Then the white buildings on Ramsey's promenade are revealed, shining brightly in today's brilliant sunshine. And here, coming down the hill towards us, is car number three, making its way from the summit down to Laxey. It's an indication that we'll be arriving at Summit Station very shortly. We've just another hundred feet to climb and we'll be there. Our journey up the mountain has been effortless, but the view of ice on the rocks to our right is an indication of just how far we've actually come. Although it's a beautiful day, it's early in the season, and the sun doesn't get to bear on these rocks for a few weeks yet. The driver reduces power from maximum as the track begins to level out, and the final constant turn continues as we swing around to the south. The dark smudge on the horizon is the English coast on the far side of the Irish Sea. And in a moment our starting point at Laxey is revealed as a little dip on the coastline of the island. It seems a long way below us now. And as we are able to look back down on the track which brought us up the side of the Laxey Valley, perhaps we should reflect on the determination and abilities of the Victorian engineers who built it, opening up this dramatic vista for all to enjoy. The Snaefell Mountain Railway holds a rightful place alongside the Isle of Man Steam Railway and the Manx Electric Railway as an important part of this island's transport heritage. And it's only proper that we should pay tribute to the visionaries who built it along with those more than a hundred years later who recognize how important it is that it should be preserved. There are few other transport experiences to match the journey we've made today. Running up a 2,000-foot mountain in a Victorian rail car to enjoy spectacular views on a stunning day is enough to gladden the heart. And we hope that this trip will inspire you to visit the Isle of Man and make the journey in person. Ahead of us, the summit station is in sight, and as the Fell Centre Rail comes to an end, it indicates that our journey is over. We've reached the top of the world, at least as far as the Isle of Man is concerned, and can look down on all of the peaks below. Thank you for joining us on this trip on the Snaefell Mountain Railway, climbing nearly 2,000 feet from Laxey to the summit of the mountain and we hope that you'll take the opportunity to visit this spot for yourself sometime soon.